Hi, I'm Nathan Barr. I'm a composer here in Los Angeles for film and television, and I'm happy to welcome Kaya and Film Music Media All Access to my studio today, Bandrinka Studios. Nate, thank you so much for mm -hmm. uh, for welcoming me here to your studio. It's amazing. Great to talk to you finally. We have to do this video chat. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so to start, I always like to ask, um, I'd love to kind of know uh, your journey to becoming, you know, to where you are today. So kind of going back to like your origin story, what do you remember from childhood that um, was really kind of the, the pinnacle turning point of what made you want to become a, a composer? Um, I started playing violin when I was about four years old. I was living in Japan with my parents and my mom started on uh, Suzuki violin. And so that was sort of the beginning of my musical education. Um, I don't, I didn't play, I was played like any four-year-old would who's not a prodigy. Right. <laughs> and uh, so I went to a bunch of music camps growing up. And then when we came back from Japan, uh, when I was about nine years old, I decided to play cello and uh, to pick up the cello. And that was uh, a decision I, I regretted at the time, uh, just because <laughs> it meant carrying this big instrument around everywhere. But I've grown, grown to love it because it's become a part of my sound. And, and uh, I met a really wonderful teacher, and like, like I think we all know in life, when you meet a great teacher, mm -hmm. it, it sort of really changes, I think, who we are and how we think about life, and, and she did that for me. Wonderful teacher named Maxine Newman in New York. And, wow. uh, so yeah, that was kind of, and then I played guitar, uh, and then I played, I got a set of bagpipes for my high school graduation, I started playing bagpipes. <laughs> so I was a little bit all over the map in terms of having lots of different instruments, because uh, my parents collected some stuff not to have a collection per se but my mom was a pianist mm -hmm. uh, my dad played banjo and, and some other things and sang and so i was just around a lot of unusual instruments growing up and i think that planted the seed for what would become a an obsession for me which is just sort of um different ways of making music yeah and then uh and certainly like with film music i always um I go back to like Dave Grusin score to Goonies or something like those. <laughs> those are like those are very formative musical moments in movies that I loved as a kid. So yeah, uh, yeah. So you, uh, how long were you living in Japan? From what age to what age? Just from like three to six. Just three to six. I was so. Really young. Yeah. So do you remember? Yeah. Do you have any memories of that time? Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah I totally do. Um, it's always hard to know that. Like I, I have a lot of pictures from then. Yeah. So I'm like, am I remembering it or am I remembering the picture of right. it? You know. <laughs> But no, I definitely, uh, I definitely have some memories. So, how did you kind of? What was the the approach you took to turn your passion into a career? Or the, did you uh, study it in, in school? Did you go out just seeking internships? What was kind of the the path to that? Yeah, so I went to Skidmore College, which is a liberal arts college in upstate New York. I was an English and music double major, and um, I played cello there a lot. I was really focused on that. I kind of burned out on that by the end of college. I took a composition class while I was there, and um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, um, and then I came to Los Angeles, and I um, basically started working at a production company because I always wanted to do something with film and television and, yeah. and ultimately music. And so uh, I was reading scripts, writing coverage oh, for nice. a company here in town. I got really burned out on that, <laughs> taking, taking home a stack of scripts that big every weekend to read. Yeah. <laughs> and so a friend and I, we bought a school bus in New York, Queens and drove it to Brazil over the course of five months. Oh my God, it's amazing. 16,200 miles. <laughs> and uh, that was a life changing experience for sure. Yeah. Um, when we got back from that, though, I had to figure out uh, what I wanted to do. And it was like one of those moments in life where I was running packages around town for that com company that I had been doing coverage for. Right. And someone said, You like film music, right? And I said, Sure. So there was a UTA job list circulating and it said prominent Hollywood film composer seeking driver slash assistant. Mm. And so I uh, applied for that and got a call back um, from a guy named Justin, who's now one of my very best friends, and it was for Hans Zimmer. And um, uh, he met with a couple other people, I think. And I think at that point, it was really important for him to just sort of find someone he could spend as much time as we would have to spend together and be comfortable. Right. More, more than my uh, music technology chops, which were just non-existent at that time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I started working for him, and that was it was like one of those, you know, 180s in life. Monday, I was driving packages around Los Angeles. Friday, I was picking up Hans and his Aston Martin. You know, it's like <laughs> my head was spinning. Like, whoa, how'd that just happen? Well, I mean, what, was he a talker in the car? Did you guys have conversations? <clears throat> yeah, we yeah. talked a lot. Yeah, I mean, you're with him all the time. Yeah. So, so it was like a really beautiful look at what someone who's at the very top of the game mm -hmm. 
how they functioned, how they lived, work, life balance. Um, and then my credit, I kind of asked him to take me on any meetings he could take me on. Yeah. So I went, I think I had one of my first uh, uh, meetings was like ice cream with Hans and Jeffrey Katzenberg. You know? that's, that's amazing. Or <laughs> dinner with Hans and Jim Brooks. Or, so yeah. it was really, he was very generous about including me um, in that stuff. And did you get to get your hands on, on music and stuff? Were you working on additional, as an additional composer? Only at this. So I was only with him for eight months. Yeah, and at short, the very yeah. end of that time, I started to dabble the tiniest bit for him on Thin Red Line. Mm -hmm. But I can't give myself any credit for yeah, that. It was yeah. like some very, very rudimentary stuff. Right. And by that time, I had a, um, a first feature film offer. So um, another reason Hans was so generous, though, was because he let me write in his studio when uh, he wasn't in there. So I put together a pretty cool demo yeah. using his sounds and his space. It was really generous. Wow, wow. Um, and then I uh, got this first feature, and then I, I, I really have always, I had a um, need to do it on my own. Yeah. Sort of, like, so, so I, I, um, I just, I wanted to do it by myself. So I, I got a studio set up, very rudimentary at my house, and, and, uh, that was kind of the beginning of the career there. So going back to that first feature, was it a? Were you excited? Were you scared? Oh, yeah. Or was it? Yeah. <laughs> what were the I emotions? Was, yeah, I was excited and <laughs> terrified at the same time. Right. Because I didn't know if I could do it. I knew I could do a short film and write a theme for a short film. I had no idea if that would translate into a feature film. And so, yeah. so it was kind of a nightmare. And again, Hans was generous. He, I brought in my first round of stuff to him. Uh, he called one day and said, oh, I, hear, I hear you're struggling, <laughs> bring it in. So I brought in this theme um, and played in this love scene. And I had started the theme before the kiss. Uh -huh. And so he's watching and he's like, oh, got to wait for the kiss, you know? <laughs> and then as I was leaving, he said, Nate. And I said, yeah, I turned around. And he's like, now that you got all the shit out of your system, go write some music. <laughs> That's a very honest thing so to tough say. Tough love. <laughs> So it um, was, uh, yeah. 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 But, but, but going through that, I mean, everybody, you know, people always look up at these at successful people and go, oh my God, how to become successful. But I think, you know, to learn, you have to fail. And early on, you have big to time. fail. And so what were kind of those early in your careers, what were the big failures that learned to uh, learning moments that you kind of mm -hmm. know not to do ever again? Or <laughs> Yeah. I think it was like, I don't know if it was failure as much as it was doing something just okay. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Like, I guess there were a lot of films I wanted to do, which I didn't get, uh. um, whether I wrote a demo for it or not. Mm. Um, but I think just, like, those first couple of features, and, they, like, I, I, I think there was a hint of something that I could do this for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, you know, I don't think I did a great job or anything on those. And it's just about, you know, sort of that, lying on the floor of the shower in the morning in a fetal position, yeah. wondering, you know, if, if I can actually do this. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And then you sort of struggle and stumble your way through it and then figure out, okay, I can do that. And each, each film, even to this day, is a totally new experience that presents yeah. a new set of challenges. And, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I mean, so you, you were very lucky very early on in your career. You got to, of course, meet and work with Eli Roth. Yep. Uh, on Cabin Fever, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so talk about, I guess, uh, first of all, talk about meeting Eli for the first time. How'd you guys get connected? How'd you get that job? And yeah. And uh, let's we'll start with that. Yeah. Yeah, I think like um, so. I was uh, represented by Rich Jacobellis, who's a who's an agent uh, who's been around as long as I have. Mm -hmm. um, he was the fiance of Mo Nakamoto, who was Hans's one of his assistants at mm -hmm. the time. So she took my demo that I wrote in Hans's room and gave it to him, and he was an assistant to Richard Kraft, and so he, um, Rich, um, hip pocketed me, and basically said, "All right, well, let me see if I can get you a film." And so he, we got one pretty quick, um, and so so that was kind of the uh, uh, yeah how how that happened. Wow. Um, and and I think from from then on it was sort of like he. You can always sort of trace things back, right? If you mm -hmm. follow the thread. And so Rich introduced me to a producer on a film no one's heard of called <clears throat> Venus and Mars. And uh, that producer somehow met Eli and somehow produced Cabin Fever and told Eli he had to meet me. And so Eli came over to my studio, which was on the on the an apartment in Westwood that I was living in at the time. And he walked in and like I had this, you know, 
huge DVD collection of horror films, and, and I think we just immediately connected to that. The fact that we both had subscriptions to Fangoria when we were kids. <laughs> um, so we just had a nice rapport. Yeah. And Eli had such a commitment to his vision from the beginning, which I think shows in that film. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was going to make um, some really cool... Um, films <laughs> so it's just, it's just like hitting it off pretty quickly right? yeah like, right exactly and that was such a, i listened to that score now and i kind of blush but it, it, it was like <laughs> you know it was no money it was yeah. it was super low rent it was me multi-tracking my cello which has a really um weird phasey sound to it <laughs> but it kind of worked for the film yeah you know, it's like a very sort of um like low rent podunk kind of approach I to I think it works perfectly score. for it. Yeah, yeah exactly. what the score uh, what the movie is. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a great uh great experience. So when you first uh you first worked with Eli and then you kind of continued onward with him and with films like Hostel and uh the House with the Clock on the Walls recently. Um how has that uh relationship evolved over the years? Has it is it just like going back and hanging out with a bud every time you're making a film or yeah. is it um is it harder to wow him <laughs> now these days or is no, he <laughs> I, mean, I, I think we just still we share we just share a, a commitment to music and storytelling and film that's really similar mm. and so eli went off after so i did cabin fever hostel hostel 2 and then eli as you probably know went down to chile yeah and did uh green inferno knock knock for which he used other composer yeah and then Death Wish. Right, right. And then he circled back on House of the Clock on his walls. And we really just picked up where we left off. But I think I had, what, 25 films under my belt since we last worked together. Yeah, something so it was, like it that. Was, yeah. And he had a couple of films under his belt. So, like, House of the Clock on his walls, we were just, it was so seamless and so, um, dare I say, easy. Like, yeah. we just, we just, he had always wanted to direct a film that was a throwback to those Goonies, you know. Those films we loved as kids, Gremlins, and I had always wanted to score a film like that. So it just it was like two really excited kids like finally um, yeah. getting to do this thing, and it was at Amblin, and it was with Steven Spielberg, and it was just like this sort of total dream, you <laughs> That's know? That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so you t talked about your love for horror that you shared with Eli. <laughs> um, what about that genre speaks to you? And I mean, you've you've done an amazing amount of your career in horror. Um, what what about that genre that you do you love about it? I mean, it's just my, it's my favorite genre to watch too. Yeah. Just as an audience, yeah. I just I just think like anything that um, so success when it's a good film so successfully puts us in a space of being in terror, uh -huh. but in the safety of your living room or a movie theater. <laughs> yeah. Is there something really? It's like a roller coaster. You yeah. Know, you know, and like if I think of the the horror films I've really loved over the past couple of years, um, it follows. Oh, amazing. The Conjuring, the first one, The Witch. Yeah, Witch was great. Um, there are a couple others. It's just been some really interesting. I really loved Hereditary. I don't know if you saw that. Loved. Thank you for so saying that. Good. Loved Hereditary. Yeah. It's it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. 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 That was probably, <laughs> I've seen it three times. That was probably the best single experience of a horror film I've had in a long, 20 years. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. Yeah, it was incredible. So, yeah, so that, that so that, okay, so Hereditary, a film like that, like, yeah. It was so well acted. It was so uh, terrifying. It had such a unique voice in terms of the filmmaker. Um, and I don't know when those things come together in a horror film. It's just it's I get so excited about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, in your opinion, what makes a good horror score? Oh, um, I mean, it depends. Like on like when we're talking about. Well, I mean. I think it's always to terrify people, right? Yeah. But I think, like, if you look at all the great horror films, and Hereditary is included in this, like, if you look at Rosemary's Baby, or if you look at The Exorcist, yeah, um, being among some of the better better films, like, it's it's a mother losing a child, yeah, you know, or in fear of losing a child. And that's what Hereditary is too. And so, um, I don't know. I think like to successfully plug into the, I'm thinking of like Tubular Bells and. Uh, the Exorcist, yeah, or that great theme in uh, Rosemary's Baby. Like, there's just to be able to plug into the beauty and the strangeness of the terror of it all somehow. When films do that successfully, I think that's always an exciting um, take on on a horror film. Um, obviously, it needs all that sort of 
um, iliatoric or atonal stuff as well. Yeah, but but yeah. I think when it when you when you plug into the emotion of it um, and and the, the dramatic part of the story, it makes it that much more terrifying. Yeah, absolutely. And I yeah. also love uh, horror scores that kind of embrace thematic, you know, bold themes and everything that can yep. really connect you. And that's it pulls you in emotionally. And Definitely. Then, and then it leaves room to kind of. Uh, you distort those things and yeah. take you away from it further away so it's more uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. and then like Kubrick did it so brilliantly in The Shining and yeah. Jerry Goldsmith in The Omen and I mean they're just and then then uh, we'll check Kalar and Dracula. Oh, God. I love you that know, score. yeah, that that's one of my favorite horror scores. Did of you pick all time, up the La Land one that came out? I'm going it's to. It's so good. Yeah, I, they did a great I, job. I adore that score. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah, and yeah. So so cinematic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you since you're such a you mean you have a great passion for different instruments and world instruments? Are there certain instruments that you have for certain i guess emotions like do you use piano for this or do you use strings for this or percussion for this or is any instrument able to be manipulated to whatever you need it to be i think it's like yeah i try and use any instrument i can to do anything in the moment um i do use strings a lot because i play guitar and cello mm -hmm. so um i have a indian instrument called a dilruba which i use a lot for some of the screechy stuff yeah um and, but yeah, I think it's, I don't know if it's a go-to um, as much as, as it is like what whatever I'm feeling on the day or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, even this this thing up here, I'll show you. I can, can take it down. You know, this is a human bone. Um, it's called a kanglang. It's wow. a f human femur. Uh -huh. And it, uh, it's, uh, so it's been hollowed out, right? And uh, it has a mouthpiece on it. And I've had some really... Um, great brass players come in and try and get a sound out of it and it's not meant to be musical per se yeah but it it does it does make some really amazing sounds i'm using it in this new show on amazon called carnival row um and uh so yeah that that's an example of an instrument that and is, where, where is it from it's i think it's from tibet wow yeah and it's probably 200 years old something like that wow um can you play a little bit uh, you can't really no. it's just <laughs> Now, if you take, if you really like spend half an hour blowing yeah. into the thing, you start to get little moments mm. of like, wow, that, what just happened there? That was interesting. And then if you take that and you add, mm. work with that, a whole so. bunch of effects to it or something, it starts to sound really cool. That's really awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's talk with the, about some of your uh, kind of projects. We talked about Cabin Fever a little bit. Yeah. But really, right after, soon after that, you did uh, Club Dread. Right. Which was right. A, a, kind of a spoof of your comedic take on, on that horror genre. What was yeah. it like scoring? A, 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 a comedy of a horror comedy versus like a more traditional straightforward was it any different or what did it require it was, it was like uh so over the top yeah silly silly <laughs> i mean those guys are yeah so over the top yeah they are <laughs> i think it was just about like going along on the ride yeah of the film and like and uh yeah i think it wanted to be ridiculous and play into the tropes of what one would expect a horror yeah. film to sound like but that's one of those scores i kind of listen back to and i go mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not uh I, it was like that film was done over the course of a year it was edited i think the first cut of that film was like three and a half hours or oh something my God. So, wow for... <laughs> so it, it had a lot of like exploration as they found the film yeah same for me as the composer yeah um and i just uh yeah, I, I guess I don't listen back to that one and go, that's my best work, you know? <laughs> um, so you talk about, yeah, it was three and a half hours, and of course, in a comedy is not going to be more than 90 right. minutes usually traditionally, right. but um, talk about picture changes, because I think as a composer, that's probably such a, I can't imagine yeah. when you have everything set perfectly and they go, yeah. oh, we're taking three seconds here and two seconds here. How do you keep your score from yeah. collapsing, I guess, in that sense, especially? Yeah, it's, I, I, think, I think most composers would agree it rarely gets better mm -hmm. as you cut up a cue to make it work. Sometimes it requires a whole rewrite. Sometimes, like 4% of the time, it gets better by just circumstance yeah. and by chance. But um, yeah, it's one, of the, it's one of the difficult things about what we do as you know, film TV composers. It's just, it's not, our show isn't about us. You yeah. know? We're, we're helping tell a story. Right. And uh, so... I, but it's also one of the things I love about it, like tempo, the length mm -hmm. of something, when their changes happen. Like it's a, we get the scene and it's a perfect roadmap for a piece of music. And learning over the years how to like look at a scene, and read that scene, and yeah. translate that into a piece of music that 
works in the body of the work, but hopefully also can exist away from it is really exciting. Yeah, I always, I always love, what made me fall in love with music, because I'm not a musician, but I pursued what got me into filmmaking and, yeah. and loving of film, is like when you take that music away from it, it's like, I was kind of the equivalent of like putting your hand in the snow and you take your hand out. You know that it's supposed to be a hand there. You yeah. see the shape still. And I yeah. think the score is kind of this I like skeleton that. I like of, that. Of, the, of, the, yep. of the film. I always use it to build scenes in my head and stuff like that, yeah. even if it's away from the movie. Yeah, and I know like a lot of writers too, right? Oh, they the put on scores writing. and the they best write. Writing yeah, tool. yeah. I always yeah. tell other writers, I'm like, exactly. use, use, use scores. Like yeah, that'll get yeah. your juices going like really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. totally. Um, so we mentioned earlier Hostel and Hostel 2. Yeah. Um, working with Eli Roth again. Yeah. Uh, so those films, were, of course, were labeled torture porn movies. Right. These, are, these are horror that is, goes for the visceral reaction. And, and so where, how did, what, what did it need musically from you when it's something that's so visually graphic and right. horrifying? Where, right. did, where was the music's role in those films? I mean, Eli's like piece of direction there, I think it was in Hostel, was like, I want people, when they cover their eyes, to still get totally fucked up by the sound. <laughs> And he wanted the music to be a part of that. So I think yeah. it was a full-on assault between the visuals, the sound effects, and the music. Yeah. Um, and so... But the interesting thing was like to take that sort of Bernard herman traditional orchestral approach yeah. to that. I don't know. I wonder if that was made today, if, if it was a different director, if they'd want something electronic. Um, so it was really nice to yeah. do something them thematic with melody in a traditional orchestral setting. And I mean, with Eli, a lot of the times it's about like, just, just when you throw it in the kitchen sink, <laughs> throw in another kitchen sink, you know? <laughs> in the best of ways, like it's yeah. part of his filmmaking. And all those scenes are so, as you said, incredibly graphic. Right. And so it was just about like sort of getting as sort of down and dirty and, and over the top with the music. Was it was there ever a time where, was it possible to do too much musically? Did you have to like, oh, this is weight, dial it back a little bit not or we just really. kept pushing more not really like yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i learned in cabin fever like with eli like we it was just always like there's there's really no ceiling to yeah, it like, that's it's awesome just, you know it's which is fun <laughs> yeah. So, yeah yeah totally um another amazing uh project that you did was of course true blood which was uh, a huge phenomenon on hbo yeah you know, yeah that uh, I, I remember when it came out and and watching it and all that my friends were it was one of those you know b before binging was there it was like we were yes. just waiting for that next episode yeah exactly um yeah. so talk about working with uh you know creator alan ball yeah. and um how did that score evolve over it was like six seasons i think oh seven seasons, seven seasons. Yeah. so from the yeah. beginning to when you work on a show from literally from yeah. start to finish yeah. what was that experience like it was amazing it was it was career changing like i think everyone can vouch for the fact that in this town the at least for me, it's been a lot of like work, 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 just movies, movies. I've done 40 films now. Yeah. And then hopefully you meet that one person who anoints you, who's respected in town, and then the phone starts ringing. And so it's certainly Alan Ball with True Blood. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, he was, I love Alan. Like, we're still working with him because we're, uh, Elizabeth Scott and I are, are doing the True Blood musical for Broadway. We've had that in development for six years, five years now. Wow. So um, Alan, Alan has been involved on the periphery with the story as we develop it with a wonderful writer named Andrew Russell. Um, so it, it lives, True Blood lives on like That's in our amazing. lives. Um, but Alan is, was like such a great filmmaker to work with because he always just talks about the emotional um, approach of the, of the music. And if, if, he's, if he's not getting something, it's never about oh, the, the flute sounds wrong there, or mm. this or that. It's always about, like, I don't feel sad enough, I don't feel frightened enough, I don't feel, you know, happy enough, whatever it is. Yeah. And then, and those are the best collaborators sometimes because they they give you something um, specific from an emotional standpoint and then let you work out whatever the craft is, whether you're doing hair and makeup or Yeah, you know, that means it's your job to translate that into yeah. the music stuff. It would it'd probably exactly. be a nightmare if you had a director who was also a musician. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> and be like, yeah. ah, shift this note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that was like one of those shows, again, that was like very thematic, which yeah. was great. And like the first thing I came up with was a guitar thing with Bill and Sookie's theme. And I remember... Alan came to my studio in Topanga and I was so nervous to play it for him and um, it's in the first episode they played him the theme and he like was like oh my god thank you like I feel something between them in, yeah. a, in a new way so it was like really uh, it was really exciting that's awesome yeah and and, and the, the, the difficult thing about across 80 episodes of anything is yeah. just like 
<clears throat> um, that theme was pretty old after even season one. Right. So, so we came up with another theme, or I came up with another theme for them that then launched us through season two, and then we could bring that back the original theme here and there throughout. Yeah, Same thing happened in the Americans where, like, uh, Elizabeth's theme, um, you can overuse it so fast. Yeah. So season two or three, I came up with a family theme that sort of, which fit really well with the story, too, because that was becoming more about family. So. Yeah, Americans was another fantastic show. I mean, talk about yeah. finding the soundscape for that. I mean, kind of, kind of this Cold War thriller. Yeah. I mean, a yeah. little bit uh, different world than something like True Blood yeah. or Hemlock Grove or something yeah. like that. So yeah. what was it like with the Americans, which is, again, another fantastic... Yeah, Americans, yeah. like, um, I wrote a demo. So that um, producer, one of the producers, uh, Joel, Joe Weisberg was the creator. Joel Fields is the, the, Fields is the producer, a showrunner, uh, and they're writer, the writers, too, and... Mm. I worked with Joel years ago, and we were hoping to find something again. And so he called me about this this show, uh, The Americans, and um, I r watched the pilot, and my head like exploded. Yeah, I was like, "This is the best thing I've ever seen in my life." <laughs> so I went off and spent a weekend. I wrote like a seven-minute suite mm. um, using my pianos with the mallets and all that stuff, and they loved it. So they got hired, and um, it was. Um, we wanted to come up with a sound that was not overtly like Red Army Choir, Russian. That would have been so on the nose. Yeah, yeah. So we, we talked about keeping it away from that. And then again, it was very thematic as well. Um, cello theme for Philip and the, the <clears throat> little mallets inside the piano for Elizabeth. And um, it was a, that was such an exciting show for me because it was yeah. so dramatic and I just love so that So well done. And so and the <laughs> yeah. characters were rich. The writing was amazing. The <clears throat> yeah. design, everything came together. It must have been a, it yeah, did. a canvas for it your did. music. Yeah. <laughs> it did. And the editors, I have to give a shout out to the picture editors on the Americans because um, they were particularly awesome with music. Like, yeah. There were a couple times where like they took a previous cue. There was actually one cue at the end of one of the seasons. I don't remember which one. I think it's season four. Dan Valverde is the editor and he put he just took two of my cues and literally kind of put them on top of each other, had uh -huh. them playing at the same time, but kind of in a way that kind of worked. Yeah. And, and I watched, it was like a three-minute cue, and I just watched them like, I never, ever would have done that or thought of that, and it works great. Oh, my God. And Joe and Joel were like, this is perfect. So, That's amazing. So it's always great when you get picture editors um, who, who really understand music. Yeah. Um, is, it, is, it, is there any difference working on a show <laughs> like... Uh, a Netflix show or an HBO show where there are no commercials versus something that's on network television that has like an act out, uh, you know, do you have to structure your music and make sure you know when that act is act out is coming or? I think yes and no. I think like, there, I think in the beginning when Netflix was doing this, I did one of their first shows, Hemlock Grove. Yeah, right. And there was a paranoia about, um, was the fact that people were binge watching these things something to consider in something being too repetitive, like a theme. Mm. And I, I, I honestly don't think it is necessarily. Yeah. Um, and I, th I feel like there's less pressure from them about that now. I think, I think everyone's figured out what the binge watching experience is yeah. and what the worries need to be and what they don't need to be. And so, um, uh, yeah, there was a lot of like paranoia about that. And we kind of tried to dance around it as much as we could and not overuse things. But, um, and also with Netflix, I mean, they, uh, each episode, I mean, they literally don't give you like 10 seconds before you can <laughs> dovetail into the next episode. And it almost picks up certain shows. Now, literally, the scene is the same shot as it was. Right. So did you, was it hard to structure uh, Hemlock Grove as like a, like each episode? Or do you have to kind of make it, thread it through and make this kind of a long, I guess, piece? It, it is a long piece, long yeah. story. But no, it's not, it's not, it wasn't no. challenging. No, it was, it was pretty straightforward. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was like, yeah, I mean, it's almost like, all right, and go, and it feels like it just ticks right up right again. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you did another fantastic show, completely in different realm, Sneaky Pete for, yeah. for Amazon. Right. Um, talk about something that's like really kind of character focused, and and uh, what about that show? You know, what did it need musically from you? Yeah, so this was a fun one because uh, Stephen Lukacs, who who was my assistant for four years at the time, I think. He just busted his ass and did such an amazing job. He was such an unbelievable learner and a great assistant, a uh, great arranger, great mixer. And I said, let's find a show that we can co-score together. 
And so this Amazon show came in called Sneaky Pete, which Brian Cranston was um, bad guy in and producing, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Giovanni Ravizzi. And so we sat down a couple years ago, whenever it was, and kind of came up with something together um, and very quickly found a sound for the show that, that then that demo we sent over, we got hired based on that. Wow. And so it was really... It's an interesting one because there's a lot of source in the show and the score is very contemporary. Uh, it's guitar, bass, yeah, yeah. drums, all that stuff. So I, I always, I've always felt like it gets lost a bit with the songs mm -hmm. or you look at it like it's just it's seamless going between songs and the, and the sound of that. But um, uh, it's something Stephen and I have really enjoyed doing together. Uh, it's, it's, was, it's kind of the first co-collaboration I've done with someone. Yeah. Um, and uh, if 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 it's the right person, it's really a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to 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 sort of take an approach together. You have to change pace from being trapped here by yourself usually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's been a bunch of so season three of that comes out um, in a couple months. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so kind of going back to uh, the house <clears throat> with the clock in its walls, um, you talked about a little bit about kind of capturing that early, you know, uh, Spielbergian type, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, magic, but um, you did have a amazing guest piece instrument <laughs> yeah. uh, on the yeah. score. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about let's talk about the the instrumentation, the score, yeah. and how your your new toy fit into it, and uh, and maybe we can talk about the history of that of that amazing machine out there. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so the whole journey that kind of led me to this studio mm -hmm. with that organ, that Wurlitzer, started honestly with Helmut Grove. So I have to credit Eli, like he, he kind of um, was one of the ones who brought me on board for that. Wow. And there was something in the first pilot script, which I had read, that uh, evoked, that made me remember a collection, a very odd collection in Wisconsin. Uh, it's called The House on the Rock. Mm. Uh, and it's just a guy who collected everything, including carousels. And wow. you go, it's one of those collections, it takes a couple hours to go through, it's huge, built in and around this house, but through these tunnels and... And you buy a ticket and just kind of... Yeah, yeah. yep, exactly. It's a, it's a sort of a destination stop. Wow. Um, and as a kid, you walk through and go, this is amazing. It's like Willy Wonka or something. Yeah. And as an adult, you go and you go, this is really <laughs> fucked up and weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's somewhere in between those two, yeah. two things. But uh, that collector had a series of automatic mus musical instruments which I've now come to understand are complete fake. Mm -hmm. But um, there are real instruments like those that exist. And so that's a long-winded way of saying the pilot script made me remember that collection and I tumbled down the rabbit hole mm -hmm. of automatic musical instruments. Um, and ultimately that led to me hearing a Wurlitzer again, starting to get into the, the that world and then finding out that the Wurlitzer from Fox Studios, which I didn't even know they had one, was still in existence, even though it was in crates at the time. So that whole, if you build it, they will come. Like yeah. I kind of just went on faith that like, if I s spent all this time and these resources building this place, that the right opportunities would come up to use that. So about six months before completion of the studio, Eli called about House on the Clock and its Walls. Mm. And I saw, I think I saw a rough, I read a script and there was actually a talking organ, pipe organ, in the movie. And I was like, this is crazy. Wow. And then I saw a very early rough cut, and there was like some organ stuff floating around there. I was like, what are the chances? Yeah. So I had Eli, I told him about this, and he was thrilled about it. And so I was racing to finish this studio in time to be able to record orchestra here yeah. and record the organ. Wow. So it was like this incredible amount of stress. <laughs> and I had... Uh, uh, Peter Cobbin and Kirsty Whaley from Abbey Road, uh, they're now on their own, coming over to do test recordings here before we recorded House of the Clock and its Walls. Wow. So, so we had these, this incredible pressure and deadline, and uh, it all came together so beautifully. And uh, that that organ is all over the film in the score. Even when you don't hear it, it's there, yeah. and just sort of filling in space. It's such a such an exciting instrument that I'm just starting to experiment with. But that was the perfect vehicle to actually let it also express itself as it was intended, which is a 1920s silent film accompaniment kind of thing. So it was just sitting in 
crates <clears throat> at Fox. It was just like boxed away. So basically, it was installed uh, in October of 1928 at Fox Studios on the wow. scoring stage. Uh, it was it remained there until 1998. Um, as I mentioned, like Bernard Herrmann used it in uh, Journey to the Center of the Earth. Dave Gerson awesome. still. Uh, Alex Norris, Dimitri Tionka, Jerry Goldsmith, John Williams used it in Empire of the Sun, which is a V-Stoic, Home Alone. Uh, oh, it's the organ you hear in The Sound of Music when Maria gets married in the church. <laughs> so it has this incredible history in film music, yeah. and it was just forgotten about. Wow. And Fox just kind of threw it out in 1998. Unfortunately, a guy who knew about pipe organs came in and lovingly um, removed it in... It needed to be an organ man to remove it. Yeah. These these instruments, of which there were thousands back in the twenties, there there are so few left. Yeah, yeah. Most of them are gone and destroyed. Yeah. Or you get hobbyists or enthusiasts pulling them out. It's a disaster. So this was lovingly removed by professionals, and so it was. It, it's it's such an unusual instrument on many levels, but the fact that it's intact and it was in the shape it was in is is extraordinary for an instrument that's you know ninety years old. That's amazing. So. Um, and Fox was just like, yeah, you can buy it. Like, <laughs> or... Yeah, you know, it's a bottom line thing. Yeah. They looked at it, they said, how much is this going to cost to restore or, or maintain? And they're like, yeah, yeah get rid of it. I you just... know, it's, it's, I mean, it's really sad, you know. Yeah. But um, thankfully, I became completely obsessed with it. <laughs> and obviously, I built a whole, you know, facility around it. Um, and Danny Elfman just used it in The Grinch. Yeah. I put it in the house of the clock as well. So I love literally within six weeks of it up and running it was in two major motion pictures that's so amazing. that's exciting and yeah. then i'm using it all the time in um this new show carnival row on amazon which comes out end of this year it's being used there all over i mean i use it constantly and not even just as an organ mm. it's a 20s synth you know it's a 1920s yeah, you can create synth. Some amazing textures and incredible sounds. and it's that's like when i first heard it i was like oh, i love the nostalgia of it i love the history of it i love the mechanics of it but as a composer, I was like, oh, my God, like, yeah. that sound. What's that sound? That sound, you know. So it's, I'm just at the beginning of really exploring it, and it's incredibly exciting. I can see you probably now sitting in, in like, a pitch meeting and be like, how about an organ? <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, like, it takes a bit of re-education because yeah. when everyone hears the organ, they go, oh, God. <laughs> you I know, know, yeah, you know, I know. It's such, like, a... And the irony of this instrument is is ninety percent of ninety nine percent of the time it was used, it was used as a church organ. Yeah, it's not a church organ; it's a theater organ. It does a very different sound. It yeah. can masquerade as a church organ, but um, it's been exciting for me not to tell people I'm using it. Yeah, then they'll come over and review a cue, and they're right. like, "Oh my god, I love that!" And I'm like, "That is entirely that organ." I'm like. What? Yeah. You know? So it's, I know like, you, it's like the the theremin where it just like has a connotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, it's only for this. Right. But it's like, no, it can be yeah. anything. It can, although I think that's a tougher one to hide. <laughs> the yeah. the theremin was yeah. tougher. Yeah. Although Justin uh, did a pretty good job recently on um, First Man. He kind oh, of cool. incorporated it in there. But it's, cool. yeah, theremin's a bit harder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, like recently with Interstellar, like Hans kind of yeah. brought the change. Like, hey, this is not just a... Yeah. Horror or religious thing. Although that thing. was, again, a church organ. It yeah. was like being used as a church organ. Yeah. And it was beautiful. It was, it was wonderful. Yeah. Um, but th this instrument is, is, as I'll show you, something quite different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk about the the history of uh, you talked about the history of the studio, but also what the the name. So you were yeah, talking yeah, about yeah. the history of Bandrika. And what yeah, it's the, called Bandrika. Uh, Bandrika. Yeah, B A N D R I K A. It's it's a tough name for people to get, which I understand. <laughs> So I love Hitchcock, and one of my favorite early Hitchcock films is called The Lady Vanishes, mm -hmm. and that entire movie takes place in a fictional European country called Bandrika. Ah. And so I like that it tipped a hat to one of my favorite filmmakers in a movie I adore. Yeah. And there's a very it's a very musical country in the in the film, the, and the whole premise of the movie is based around a musical theme in code from a spy so it, it just all kind of was like I, I loved the exoticness of it and and so that's why I called this studio that that's amazing yeah, yeah. <laughs> so are we sitting is this where you come to write is this kind of where you sit yeah yes this is my writing room behind me these books this is a, a diffusion wall uh -huh. uh, most times when you see a diffusion wall it's like a you know multiple panels that yeah. sort of diffuse the sound and I wanted to do something with more vibe yeah. than that and so I talked to my acoustician, and we we talked about the idea of books. Wow! And so you can actually buy books by the foot 
believe it or not. And you can buy books by the foot very specifically from like the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, different sizes, shapes, colors, whatever. And so we, uh, my acoustician calculated 66% of the wall needed to be diffused. And so we bought multiple sizes of books and we specified, I think the earliest book here is probably 1820s, 1810. And then it goes up to the 50s, 1950s. So, I, and inadvertently, what I love is like, just as like there's that organ from the 20s in there, yeah, it ties this room in with a bit of history as yeah. well, which wow. is kind of cool. So are these arranged in a specific way? It's like, no. No? No. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it just needs to be diffused. Just yeah, diffused, yeah. Okay. So, so the only way it's arranged is that you want as little uniformity as possible. Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, just spread it. Spread it. It's not like you can't take a book down. Okay. And, <laughs> and ruin we, thing, we, yes. Yeah. You know, we found all these cool. You know, they're all real old books. Here's Reveries of a Bachelor. And so we were looking <laughs> in here. I just sometimes go through these books. You know, and someone. This is from the 1800s. There are pressings. Yeah, here we go. Four Leaf Clovers. Wow. Uh, and then this <laughs> book. You know. What is this? Elizabeth Stuart Phelps, Gypsy, Sarah McCullough, March 3rd, 1908. So there are all these cool little wow. transcriptions, and it's just a really nice way. Like, I'll just, if we're mixing something, I'll yeah. just kind of wander back here and through and them, yeah. poke through books, and we found some really cool stuff. That's incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's also kind of, you need a break or something and just to <coughs> yeah, rejog yeah. your mind or something. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> there are a, lot, the a lot of the books are art and history and music and just by chance. Yeah. So it's, it's cool. And then I also have seen the other cool thing that I was like, there were some producers who were sitting back here for a couple hours when we were doing the sessions and they yeah. just grab a book down and read through it. And that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. So, I mean, talking more about your general approach, uh, yeah. we, we talked a lot of your individual projects. I know it's going to be different on every film, but sure. where does the first note typically come from for you where does that like first area of inspiration do you like seek out just sitting with the director or do you read the script if you can or is it just yeah. watching the first cut of the film yeah i mean well hopefully you like the project yeah and you don't have to take it to pay the bills <laughs> yeah and we all have to do that every once in a while right um so if i think it's always like for me about finding like um hopefully it's a great project mm-hmm. like the americans or something um if it's not a necessarily a project I relate to, then I try and find something in it I relate to, mm. a character or something Yeah. Uh, emotionally. And so that's kind of where it starts. Um, and then it's just about, I think as any composer who does this will tell you, like one of the things you figure out over time is you can just watch something and know, for example, if it's going to be orchestral or not. Like yeah. there's just, there are so clearly some things that you look at it and you're like, the orchestra would sound really weird. Well, you don't even need to try it. It would just, you just know it would. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, and then sometimes I'll go buy a new instrument or something that I'm not familiar with if I think that could work. Um, there's an instrument over there called a nickel harpa. Mm-hmm. Um, that took four years to get. So I, I use that in a show called The Sun. Um, and I've, and I've used it quite a bit in some other shows. And that, so that was an instrument, it was like an instrument I didn't know that well that I could kind of play because it's like if you took a cello bow and then a hurdy gurdy or, or a violin guitar and it plays um, wow. so so yeah so it's like I, I don't know just keeping it fresh you know somehow and for me that's buying uh, a new instrument or something that's one of the ways it happens is there a certain uh, region of the world that really that you love in terms of their types of instruments that really speak to you not really uh, no I think there's every culture has something interesting that they've done I mean weirdly every culture has most cultures have a bagpipe yeah you know? wow there are probably hundreds of variations of bagpipes around the world that have nothing to do with each other, really, other than mm-hmm. a large animal skin or bladder you blow air into that then you have something you play. Yeah. So it's an African bagpipe on my left, and then mm-hmm. a set of sm- uh, small pipes from Scotland on my right. Um, uh, Portuguese bagpipes. So yeah, that's pretty interesting to see. All, all cultures somehow thought, let's fill a reservoir with air, and stuff a chanter. It's something you blow into yeah. and a thing you play. <laughs> kind of weird. And it's kind of weird, <laughs> but, I mean, but cool. So very cool. Yeah, I mean, do yeah. you? How often do you go exploring for new instruments? Is it? Are you always on the lookout for all something? the time? Yeah. I, I I sort of made a deal with myself that I will always have an instrument on its way to me or in restoration or something. That's exciting. <laughs> so I have a, a really unusual instrument right now that's going to be tied into another instrument I invented in there. 
uh, that is being restored right now over wow. the next couple months. That's from 1923. That's um, amazing. So yeah, just like, I don't know, it's just exciting. As you'll see, like there's so many, uh, so, so many brilliant people put their minds to making music in unusual ways, yeah. like the Wurlitzer. And uh, I just like getting caught up in all that magic. You know. And also, it's thinking outside the box also is what creates new paths, I think. So we're not right. just kind of recycling the same stuff and over yep. and over again. So yep. Also, for you creatively, I'm sure that's just a new ch challenging you every time to kind of find new things and stuff. It is, yeah, totally. Yeah. And, like, and then maybe picking up an instrument I don't know how to play and you can still get sounds out of it that yeah. might be useful. You that's know? awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, what's your favorite part of the entire process? Like from that first getting hired to submitting that score and everything is mixed and complete like what's was there a part of that or parts of it that you really look forward to but... i think the favorite part is when i finally come up with a good theme that yeah. i like yeah yeah that that moment where, where i find a theme that i know is working uh and it it's just sort of born and then the filmmakers like it too that's yeah that's that's a... a really fun part of that and then like figuring out how to make that theme play throughout the film and develop it and that's something really exciting but honestly i just love like writing a picture i love that I've been doing this, I've done this tens and tens of thousands of hours, if not more. Yeah. <laughs> and and I just like that um, because I've had so much time at it, I can look at a project pretty quickly and just decipher a scene, what it needs to be, where it needs to go. That's just like an exciting thing for me. Yeah, yeah. That most of the world wouldn't necessarily care about but <laughs> <laughs> is it is it nerve-wracking to present your music to a producer or director for the first time yeah always yeah I, I it's a like little it... bit less and less like his yeah. confidence goes up a bit but it depends on who it is too yeah, like sure i was petrified like... the first time i was going to play it for alan ball yeah because i really respected him as a storyteller and um uh but yeah as you as you're as we're able as composers to plug into things that those people respond to it it's a little less scary, but it, it can still be pretty also, terrifying. I think it's kind of vulnerable because it's coming from oh my God, really huge. here. It's yeah, like, exactly. Like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like that. It's one of the only parts of a film, right, where we're, we're bringing something completely original and right. new to the story. It has yeah. nothing. It did not exist before. It's not coming off the pages of the script. Mm. You know, it's, 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 it's not. It's, yeah, it's, it's just creating something wholly unique that you hope plugs into what the storyteller wants yeah absolutely yeah um so as a throughout your career you, you know you have a love for horror <clears> and <throat> you've done a lot of horror films was there ever a worry where you're like oh i just don't want to get pigeonholed into horror i mean you've, yeah, you've, sure. you've been so i mean you've done amazing other genres no but stuff. sure of course i mean it's a, it's a two things like so i've probably like a third of my career is horror yeah but most of the films that i've done have such a small audience like most people don't know about it right but of the 40 films i've done you know maybe so let's say uh f 12 to 15 15 are horror films mm -hmm. and and because cabin fever hostel i'll some of those are the best known yeah yeah you become pigeonholed but but having said that like the americans oh, yeah. just yeah. dropped into my lap through an old friend who knew that i could do something different from horror and so i think uh and then House of the Clock in its Walls, well, well, it's a horror film, it's a kid's horror film. So yeah. we as composers have so much more to say musically often than we're given as far as projects we get. No, absolutely. So recently having gotten some of these projects outside of that genre um, has been exciting. But at the same time, I love horror films. So if, if uh, I'm much more um, selective now. Yeah. If a hereditary came along, I'd do it without even thinking about it. Right. If it's not on that level, then I probably won't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's it. That's interesting. Um, when you're working with a director, or producer, um, let's say somebody, let's say like with Eli, who you're comfortable with, right? Uh, if you have a fundamental disagreement with their choice, yeah. do you? What's the process for that? If you do, you just be like, okay, let's do it your way, and and if they like, but if it, if you like, no, it really should be this way. Do you? Yeah. I mean, how do you get when you have a creative disagreement? Like, how yeah. do you do that with the director? I mean, it's like it's it's again, it's like we're we write music in service of a story. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. it's not. Nate Barr presents it's whoever the filmmaker is presents so why would I sit there and tell someone they're wrong no this is not it's their story I've been brought in to help them tell their story right doesn't mean I don't have a vision right uh, and I don't always agree but I'm not going to sit there and and tell them yeah no you're going to license that or get something that's just for me that's not the way I work right 
Um, so I think that's making it about the music, and it's not about the music first. It's about the story first. Absolutely. Um, and um, the most exciting collaborations are the ones where I may disagree, but we we let it go in that direction, and it actually does become better. Yeah. And then there are plenty of instances where I'm like, oh, I liked my way better, but yeah. if this is what they want, you know. That's right. They're the, yeah, they're... I rarely sit cringing at a choice that's been made mm -hmm. every once in a while, but it's pretty rare. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Um, so to kind of wrap things up a little bit, yeah. um, well, what, you know, it's it's 2019. What, 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 are, what are some things in the industry that's happening right now, whether it's business side or creative side that you really love that's happening? Or maybe what are some things that need improvement in, in, our, in our world? Yeah, I mean, I think like the just on the business side of things, the royalty royalty streaming and all this stuff with with Netflix, Amazon versus network. Mm -hmm. All that stuff's a little bit scary right now cuz yeah. for everyone because there's like there are so many unknowns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the 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 it'll be very interesting in the next 10 or 15 years to see where all that stuff ends up. Um, uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's 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 uh, I'm glad I got it when I did. Um, and and hopefully people will still be able to make a, a living and a good living making music. But it, it's certainly it's certainly becoming harder in some ways. Yeah, for sure. Um, you, know, you hear those horror stories about the people that write a hit song, and ten years ago they would have earned you know millions of dollars, yeah. and they get a check for like two hundred bucks. Yeah, on Spotify, you know, I've you know. seen like big name yeah. like Pharrell showing yeah. like their peanuts of yeah. like, for millions so, I mean, of streams. So the only thing that can't be taken away from them at that point is their their ability to go perform, and and uh, that's where they can that really make their money. But so that's something that's changing. It's a bit scary. Yeah. Um, otherwise, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a bigger and bigger pool of people yeah. who are interested. Yeah. Like, I think 30 years ago, there were probably far fewer people who thought of this, oh, as a viable career, mm -hmm. you know, and even then it was, it was a challenge. But so, yeah, I'd say there's like, um, just a lot more people doing it. And some of that's really exciting. Also, and, it adds to competition too. That's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that all that makes it more difficult when everyone can get a pretty good setup for much cheaper these that's days. That's true. With, with technology has gotten so far. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but I think the you know the, I think I'm so happy to be working in a time when TV has become yeah. such high quality. It's uh, as we know it in in many cases it's giving film a run for its money. Oh, for sure. I don't think you'll ever replace an amazing film experience yeah. in a theater no but you will replace the gobs and gobs of mediocre films out there with much better storytelling on i wrote an article TV. about because i think that's where the middle class of like movie making went <clears throat> it's where all the auteurs went i love it it's like because yeah it you go, to, to, go to theater now it's a yeah. one million dollar indie or a 200 million dollar yeah. marvel film so that, yeah. that middle area is like gone that's <laughs> it's right it's all on television it has, now. and it has it absolutely has gone yeah. to television and and like so whether it's like a film like Roma um, yeah. which you can't really see a film studio necessarily giving that much creative exactly. freedom to someone uh, so I think there's some really great benefits to that right now and just like again like just I've seen so many as we all have so many TV shows that yeah. are just like this is amazing like the, you know you have the Americans I was yeah, it's yeah. like that is yeah yeah quality. I think so <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly or Game of Thrones or um I mean, there are just zillions of them, and they don't. They're the uh, the uh, the crown, you yeah, know. Amazing. I mean, that, that's like every every episode is a beautiful yeah. period film yeah. of the highest quality. I mean, it's it's astounding. So that's that's the most exciting thing right now, I yeah. think, to be a part of. Because as we know, TV and music for TV in the '80s and '90s. It was a very different story. Completely different. You know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, the yeah. medium has completely changed. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to, to wrap up, if you could um, do any other job on a movie yeah. besides the, being a composer, whether it's acting, production design, yeah. directing, editing, is there anyone that you, could, you wish you could just try once just to... I mean, I think editing would be really interesting. Yeah. Writing, I've, I've tried a little bit and I hate it. Yeah. <laughs> but editing, you know, John Ottman is such an uh, oh amazing guy to be a composer and an editor. It's, yeah. It's like... He got nominated for an Oscar Exactly. Yeah. It's wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so I think uh, as composers, I think no one, um, no one's work is more enhanced, encumbered, 
defined by the editing. Yeah. And oftentimes if we're having trouble as composers, it's because the editing is a little bit shoddy or something. Yeah. So when you work with a great editor, um, uh, like I did on House of the Clock and Its Walls, um, it's, it just makes your life so much easier. Like, and, and that was, that was just pure joy. Cause yeah. like you find your tempo and, and it's just, it's, it's like beautifully set up for the composer to yeah. come in and, and, and then, and that makes our work better. So. Absolutely. Well, Nate, yeah. thank you so much for, yeah. for sitting down and chatting. Yeah. It's uh, been such a great, uh, t time picking your brain and, and thank and you for hearing your story. Taking an interest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, uh, maybe we should go explore the studio a little cool. bit. All great. Right. <laughs>